Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to the video version of the Realignment Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Tan Shanker about his new book, Age of Danger, Keeping America Safe in an Era of New Superpowers, New Weapons, and New Threats. This is all about the transition from the War on Terror era to the era where we're going to focus instead on great power rivalry, nuclear weapons, and other black swan style events like the COVID-19 pandemic back in 2020. So lots of interesting stuff here. Hope you all really enjoy this conversation. Tom Schenker, welcome to The Realignment. Thanks. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to chat with you. There are a lot of books in the genre that you and your co-author Andrew have written in, but this one really a like resonated. Um, it's a quick read and also raises just a bunch of questions that I want to just really go through you over the course of the conversation. Let's start as big picture and mission oriented as possible, though. What would you say is the central aim of U.S. defense policy? right now, or what should it be? For example, like my my contention would be that um, a good organizing principle is that our objective is to deter conflict in Asia and Europe. That's the central question. Those are the central issues. That's how I would frame it. How would you compare, contrast, frame it yourself? Right. So that's a perfectly logical one. But what our book says is that it's very hard to have very specific constructs like that, because the future will always come at you with the unexpected. I mean, think about three years ago, who would have thought that a pandemic would kill a million Americans and counting compared to the 3,000 who died on 9-11? Now, each one of those deaths on 9-11, Marshall, was a tragedy. But I think the American military prepares sometimes within too constrained a limit of risks. And what we argue is the military in particular and the nation's national security apparatus has to widen its aperture and be open to all kinds of risks. Okay, so this is where the history that you go to in the book is so helpful. I guess my perspective on that is I agree from I agree with everything you just said. That said, I think if you look at the past 20 years, the lack the lack of a strong mission principle beyond, let's say, George W. Bush in 2000 saying we're not going to do the, Clinton the Clintonian interventions framework actually led to the Afghan and Iraq wars quickly getting ahead of everybody. So I think that's just why I think on a baseline level, I think just having a broad construct is useful. So how would you, how do you deal with the fact that it is just easy to even on a historical basis, just lapse into all these different areas if you're not constrained enough. Mm -hmm. So I agree with everything that you said. And one of our arguments in the book is that by the Bush administration's laser-like focus on ter terrorism, its Zoom-like focus on terrorism, um, it stayed in Iraq and Afghanistan for what I think we all, would all agree now for far too long and didn't pay attention to a host of other risks, rising China, competition with Russia, climate change. So actually, you and I are very much in agreement, even if we're kind of approaching it from opposite ends of the rope. Yeah, that's interesting. Just, I guess the reason why I wanted to start with that question is if you're looking at a lot of the, let's just say, generational um, turnings we're going through when it comes to US defense policy, if I'm obviously like a think tank fellow, I do a podcast on a lot of these issues. So I'm thinking very in the weeds in these issues. Whenever I talk to just like a listener or someone out in the public, they themselves will say something like, well, we have a $1.25 trillion budget. We'll get into that, obviously. It's not quite clear what we're doing with that budget. It's not quite clear why we should be doing X, Y, and Z. So how would you help frame this to this, once again, somewhat jaded millennial and Gen Z cohort who are thinking of these astonishing price tags and the amorphous nature of the threats you're describing in the book? Right. Well, I'm hardly Gen Z. I'm, I'm an old, bald guy. Um, but I agree with what you said in describing their concern. $1.2 trillion is so much money. And Andy and I make the case that perhaps it's not being spent correctly because it's investing in old systems that aren't really applicable to current and future threats. And, you know, we make the case that the Pentagon is quite belatedly adopting an understanding of the threats that appeal to Gen Z. Climate change is a perfect example. You know, the, the Pentagon is hardly your liberal tree-hugging organization, but it realizes that in 20 or 30 or 40 years with rising oceans, important military installations in Virginia and California and Washington will be underwater. 
and there's just not enough money to raise that land up. Similarly, climate change prompts incredible um, forced migration. You know, one can imagine a billion people moving north from Africa toward Europe in the next 20 or 30 years. That's a climate change problem, but it's a national security problem. And the Pentagon is only belatedly really adopting, dare I say it, a Gen Z perspective on, on world threats. You know, that is such an interesting place to take things for a second, because I get what you're saying. If you just look at basic polling, um, Gen Z, um, middle-aged millennials such as myself are going to hold issues like climate change at the top of the priority area. However, if we look at the 1970s, let's say this immediately after um, the Vietnam War era, Iraqi in 1975, 76, 77, um, obviously nothing we're experiencing right now, despite all of the troubles in the, you know, war on terror is a remotely comparable to the, to the end state or Vietnam policy. There was still a Cold War, 58,000 Americans died, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That said, the Army and you know Marines, Air Force, Navy, et cetera, had recruiting crises. The actual structure didn't work. And I'm not sure that telling, let's say, Gen X or baby boomers, quote unquote, well, we're going to focus on a political trend or an issue that you're interested in, I'm not sure that would have addressed the, the crisis of confidence that the military faced at the time. So I guess comparing these two eras, how would you compare the kind of, let's say, recruitment troubles we're experiencing right now, debates about, and this could go in either direction, I'm not trying to take a stand on this issue, wokeness in the military, I'm sure there was a 1970s equivalent. How would you, it would probably be like drug, like drug use and like those different issues. How would you answer from that perspective? It's so interesting because this is the 50th anniversary this week of the Paris Peace Accords that ended the war in Vietnam. And if one thinks about the lessons of Vietnam, it's sending hundreds of thousands of Americans into a culture that the American leadership didn't understand to fight a war with uncertain, changing, and amorphous ends. Gosh, that sounds a lot like Iraq, doesn't it, Marshall? And so actually, the lessons of Vietnam are incredibly relevant today. Um, and your, your question about veterans is fascinating because Vietnam veterans came home and they were, I mean, the, the phrase spat upon is a little overly stated, but they were ignored by the American public. They were ignored by the traditional veterans organizations. The opposite is happening today. Veterans come home and they're first to board airplanes, they get discounts at Target. Uh, that's a bad example. They get discounts at Kmart. And I think both sets of veterans would say both of those responses are, are wrong. Veterans shouldn't be spat upon, but they also shouldn't be put on this false pedestal that lets the 99% of America that doesn't serve say, oh, I said thank you for your service, so I'm done here. So it's it's really interesting to compare and contrast. And think about, too, for, for, for Gen Z, the campus protest movement in the 60s played an incredibly important role in ending the war in Vietnam, without a doubt. Those were cataclysmic times. And you look today at Black Lives Matter, the, the abortion rights protests. So even though the issues are very different, I think campus activism has a lot of, you know, um, hereditary um, importance for, for today. I guess, how does the... And this isn't quite what you go into in the book, but I think it's deeply relevant during a hyperpolarized time as we're, you know, the end of the long 60s. But how does a defense department respond to that dynamic? You know, you, you, you learn all sorts of things on the path to becoming a four-star general or admiral. What you don't learn is how to navigate, um, let's say, how do you debate uh, an issue like Black Lives Matter during 2020 in the middle of a recruiting crisis? So how do you kind of see this like very outward facing institution reckon with a society that is in a, its own form of upheaval? Well, and you're putting... Um voice to a question that I guarantee is on the minds of every general from the joint staff across the, the, the services. The military is drawn from the American public, but it's not a broad section of the American public. As I'm sure you know, the recruiting figures are highest in rural New England, the South, rural West. That is hardly um, a picture of America. And these soldiers, uh, the, these troops come in carrying the biases and experiences of where they are raised. And I can assure you, military leadership is deeply concerned about the polarization in American politics infecting the ranks, whether it's hard right extremism, um, racism, um, misogyny, 
And that is a real concern. And it's curious that the army recently readopted its, you know, be all that you can be motto after several decades. Of, of not using it because they really are trying to say the military can be a place for you to grow and mature and evolve. And for decades, the American military really was a very positive engine of social change. I mean, the military led the way in desegregation. I'm not sure you can say the same today, but it really was a place where, you know, um, immigrants and people of color could come and have a bit more of a meritocracy than they could in the rest of society. And the military has to get back to being a positive engine of social change without falling prey to the polarization. What you can easily say is, you know, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, and the obviously integration um, preceded um, the legalization of gay marriage nationwide. So there is just this like tradition of the military being this force that has to reckon with uh, often like socio cultural questions um, the country faces. I want to go back to something you said earlier. You, you talked about um, a focus on old systems that aren't applicable. And this is really going to take us a bit later in the conversation into a debate about what happened during the 2000s, because I thought of what you just described described um, in the sense that I could definitely agree that, let's say, during the 2000s, there's all this focus on what's happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's less focus on what's happening with China. Like that said, we have a war in Ukraine where HIMARS are now you know, Cold War relics that no one would have thought of two or three years ago are making a deeply, deeply, deeply active um, impact on the battlefield. And we're actually having to ramp up production um, of HIMARS um, in, um, you know, in Arkansas and other states that produce them. You know, this was a this was a product project that basically fizzled out, if not for um, I think it was the UAE trying to like, get purchase orders together in the late 2010. So given what I just said, how do you think about this debate over what technology is outdated, what technology is relevant, given the Ukraine example? Well, that's an absolutely <laughs> insightful point. And it's a good thing that those HIMARS were in the inventory, to be sure. It also shows, though, the unpredictability, mm -hmm. because who would have thought that HIMARS would be so so valuable? I, I would just make the case, Marshall, that for $1.2 trillion a year, the military should be able to do more than one thing. And while it's you know building new HIMARS, it needs to be thinking creatively about China and Taiwan, where so far we'll, we're just throwing legacy systems at them. You know, like we have a dozen aircraft carriers, we have some set number of destroyers. And every war game the Navy and Air Force run, all we do is lose faster. And so there's some really deep thinking about these new systems. And one of the issues we write about in the book is how the Air Force is experimenting with an asymmetrical advantage that the US might have over China, which is to field thousands and thousands of drones to create sensor grids, attack grids, command and control grids. Each drone is not very expensive and China would absolutely wipe out its arsenal of missiles trying to take them all down, whereas China has more than enough missiles to sink five aircraft carriers. So we have to be able to do the traditional issues like HIMARS, which you so accurately pointed out. They have to put enough mental power and money into thinking anew about how America's advantages can deter a future, a current and future rival like China. You know, you're particularly the best person to ask this question because obviously you're writing a policy-oriented book now, but you were a, you know, you were actually writing and covering um, U.S. defense policy um, at the New York Times, among other publications. Why aren't they doing both? Because it's just because you know what I mean. It's easy for us to say, okay, guys, it's 2007. You need to get MRAPs to protect Marines and soldiers in in, Af in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. But come on, you also could think about addressing great power conflict. And now I say that out loud, but it's not that simple. So from your actual reporting background, what is actually happening in the room that prevents someone from actually walking and chewing gum at the same time? Right. There's, there's two voices at the table. One side says change is really, really hard. The other side says try irrelevancy. It's even worse. And, and so that's the debate that, that goes on. And there are people who are arguing that these legacy systems are adequate. And again, they're very important in Ukraine, as you pointed out, but they're not going to be sufficient in China, Thai, Taiwan. And it's really hard. And there are, um, you know, just these equities, the shipbuilders and, and in Congress. I mean, it really is a case for leadership. And, you know, one of the points we make in the book is we, we talk about, you know, the national security machine, 
but it's not a machine. It's people. And there's never been a more important time for the people and the leaders of the national security machine to, to lead with integrity and, and honesty and a lack of polarization and, and not looking for expedient political ends, but what is really best for our country. And that should lead them to the sorts of new systems I was describing to deter China. So let's talk about the leadership and personnel angle, because once again, to your point, um, so much of this story is, is is deeply about individuals and their choices and their individual leadership. Um, I always harp on this story, but I think it's such a fascinating story and how you could see all the different alternate histories here. You think of you know Donald Rumsfeld as this person who, for good or for ill, will go down in history as leading um, a very poor, um, in my telling, uh, performance in, in Iraq. Um, yet there's a different Donald Rumsfeld, the Donald Rumsfeld of literally September 10th, 2001. Usually people will say September 10th, 2001, they're referring to the before times. But again, once again, if, if you could tell this story, I think it'd be very helpful. Um, there is literally a different Donald Rumsfeld who's focused on a different set of issues and who I think would actually take a lot of sympathy from readers of this book, who I think would say, we weren't happy of how he was performing 2003, 2004, 2005. So just actually tell the story that I'm alluding to with September 10th, Donald Rumsfeld, and lessons for leadership that we should take from that. Right. Well, I can tell that you're a very uh, astute reader of history. Um, on September 10th, Rumsfeld, who was who had already become in just nine months one of the least popular members of the Bush cabinet, he gave a speech to the entire Pentagon community, uh, you know, video, hundreds in the room, where he talked about how it was time to transform the Pentagon. It was time to transform the military. It was time to leap ahead and create a more agile, leaner, efficient military. And he was saying goodbye to old systems, goodbye to calcified leadership. It was the kind of speech that is, I mean, it was the platonic ideal of a forward-looking, smart leader speech. And then, as you said, 24 hours later, his building or a section of it was burning and in rubble, and he became a wartime secretary. And I think we look back on the campaign plan for Afghanistan as a, as a, you know, as just a masterpiece, a flawed masterpiece to be sure, but small numbers of special forces, very few boots on the ground, and America's preponderance of air power had won the war by December, January, February. And then what happened? They invested too much, again, like Vietnam. They didn't understand a country. And there was a hubris that America could remake Afghanistan into a Jeffersonian democracy. And oh, by the way, within a year, they had already forgotten about Afghanistan. And because they were so confident that the quick victory in Afghanistan could be transferred to Iraq, they took their eye off Afghanistan and moved all these resources to Iraq. And we know the history after that. And if I might add just one Please. Footnote to that, you mentioned the MRAPs earlier, and those are these heavily armored vehicles that saved the lives of troops from roadside mines, which became the signature guerrilla weapon in Iraq and Afghanistan. I remember Rumsfeld was speaking to some troops about to cross into Iraq in Kuwait, and these troops were complaining back in 2003, 2004, they didn't have enough armored vehicles. And Rumsfeld said, well, you go to war with the army you have not the army you may have or might wish to have. And while that was a statement of fact, the lack of empathy of the Pentagon chief talking to troops about to cross the berm and risk their lives under his orders was just, it was just wrong. Rumsfeld was out. Robert Gates came in in 2006, and he took it his mission to save the mission in Iraq but also to save the lives of troops. And the MRAP program cost billions of dollars, was one of the fastest programs in Pentagon procurement history from idea to deployment. And I talk to people all the time whose lives were saved, whose limbs were saved, because Gates didn't say, you go to war with the army you have. He said, I'm going to get the army what it needs. That's the difference in leadership, Marshall, that you're refer referring to. And whether you are a podcast host or a retired journalist or a CEO of a company, that leadership matters. Yeah. And I want to go back to the Rumsfeld speech because you, you, you all quote it 
in the book. And it's, and it's not just because, because on the one hand, I was hearing your telling of, and I could imagine someone thinking, oh, okay, so he's just talking about his policy priorities. He's very much a revolution in military affairs guy. Obviously, he's going to talk about these weapon systems, but the, the, the attack is a deeply ideological one that many people left, right, and center would actually like resonate with. Like there's a world where like there's a president AOC um, and her secretary of defense is saying the following, which is basically what he's saying, which is there is the, the, the enemy of, of America's safety right now. It's not Russia. It's not China. It's not Saddam Hussein. Like he's explicitly saying this, it's slow thinking. It's the status quo. It's an entrenched bureaucracy. So I just think it's so important that people understand that there's just a deep nuance in defense policy that gets missed when we reduce this to a critique of like the military industrial complex and everyone wants their weapon systems. Because this was a guy, and you, you made this point when he was, you know, he was tremendously unpopular. I, I think I read this in, I recently read um, George W. Bush's Gene Edward Smith biography, but there was just like widely, it was wide conventional wisdom that he was going to be the first cabinet officer out. So it's not just that he's unpopular, so he's he's just not working. He was he was, you know, the youngest defense secretary ever back during the uh the, during the Ford administration, but he just he's just not working. He's going to be out. So I guess what I'd ask you is what was he doing wrong when he tried to enact change? Like, did you have what I'm saying? Like, what, what did he do wrong between January and September? Um to, uh, was was he too aggressive? Was he too brusque? Did he not understand the way? Was he just too old relative to the way the world had changed? Like, what do you think about this? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Haven't thought about it in just that way. So thank you for asking me so I can exercise my mind a little bit here. I don't think it, he, he was too old. I mean, he was still playing squash with his military assistants and often beating them, although I think they probably let the boss win. I think his approach was too heavy handed. He'd go into briefings and these generals and colonels and the budget folks would come out describing how they had been wire brushed. To be sure, he was the defense secretary, but I think there is a style of leadership where you bring people around to your point of view rather than beat them over the head into submission. So the army, which actually had a, a chief at the time, Eric Shinseki, who also was about transforming the army, but for some reason, Rumsfeld and Shinseki became political enemies inside the building, even though they, even though they both had the same long-term goal, which was reforming the way the military fights, make it more agile, leaner, more lethal. Um, but I think Rumsfeld's leadership style was to so antagonize people that he had a difficult time convincing them that he was right. And clearly that was going on inside the Bush cabinet as well. I'm curious if you're talking about these different leadership models, Rumsfeld's, I think Rumsfeld's background is just fascinating because you could just say he's easily probably one of the best qualified Secretary of Defense ever. He's a um, he was a Navy pilot in the fifties. He's a congressman. He was the head of the Equal Opportunity Office during the Nixon administration. He's the ambassador to uh, NATO, I believe. He's a CEO. He's he's he's, he's, he's incredible, incredible career. Um, that's that's genuinely worth studying. There's there's a couple of good books just about how um, examining the question of like how could someone just so qualified. Um, such an impressive leader just fail. So um, that, that's another conversation, but I think, I think it's worth, worth, worth thinking about. But I guess what I'm basically asking is, um, what would you say is an example of an effective transformational leader in this category? Mm -hmm. I think Secretary Gates, as I mentioned, with the, uh, the, the MRAP program, um, I think that, you know, there have been a series of, of great defense secretaries after Rumsfeld. I mean, Gates was extraordinary, I think, followed by Leon Panetta. Again, sort of a pentathlete, you know, a congressman, um, you know, ran uh, OMB, so he knows how money is spent. He was a White House chief of staff, so he knows how to beat people about the head and, head, head and shoulders, was CIA director, and then came to, to the Pentagon. So I think there are just people in time that fit better. I mean, if we wanted to do counter history, counterfactual history, what kind of defense secretary would Rumsfeld have been if there wasn't 9-11? Or even if there was 9-11, because again, the war plan for Afghanistan was a masterpiece, but then they got sucked into democracy building and all of that. But what happens if there had been a 9-11 in Afghanistan, but Iraq had been off the table? So I think there was a bit of imperial hubris 
Not that they were building an empire, but I think there was a bit of hubris that somehow infected many of the people around President Bush, including Cheney and Rumsfeld, that after Afghanistan, they could do no wrong. I think that was the problem. And I think the secretaries who followed, Gates, Panetta, Ash Carter, Hegel, Hegel, a Vietnam veteran, by the way, they came in with much more humility. And I think the mark of a great leader, a powerful leader, is the proper amount of humility. I guess what's interesting here is in your in your description of these figures, and it's not a surprise that the Defense Department goes this direction, you're very much not describing outsider figures. Um, you, you're describing figures who often were, were members of, of Congress, who had worked within corporate America, um, had like deeply, I say establishment, not in a pejorative sense, but just an establishment background. I, I, I wonder if I wonder how you assess just the contention that we need more outsiderism to enact the type of changes that you you all are advocating for and describing. It's absolutely vital. And for example, in our chapter on on storms about climate change, uh, we talked about it earlier that the climate change is a national security risk. Um, and most of the people who've driven that policy inside the Pentagon have been activists, think tank people like you, academics who came in for short periods, tried to get the Pentagon turned in that direction, and then went back into the academic or private sector. But but you're right, there's not been a, a counterintuitive defense secretary in, in modern memory. They tend to, to go to insiders of, of different stripes. And I think outside thinking is required. And there are, and that's the importance of the think tank world and the policy world. It's people outside who are writing white papers and doing closed door meetings where they can try and say, you need to look at it in a fresh way. I I appreciate you uh, being willing to let me go very, very off book. I want to get back to the book well, for a second because I think the concept- well, this is a great, It's a great discussion. Thank you so much. No, no, of course. Um, uh, but I can't brag about reading and then not actually talk about the book because that would just you know you're you're at GW so I'm sure you you're used to students and their 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 various tactics um, did not just read the chapter titles um, I, I want to speak to a a descriptor um, that you really offer around understanding like the U.S. Um, defense apparatus which is just kind of comparing it to a machine but basically saying that there there, there are two aspects um, the warning machine and the action uh, machine I want to really go through both can you just start by describing what the warning machine is and what the action machine is how they differentiate of course we tried to come up with a framework Marshall where I mean we wrote this book for general interest readers I mean people like you probably didn't learn much people at the Pentagon won't learn much but we think this debate is so important for the general public to be involved in. So we wanted to come up with an easy way to break down this $1.2 trillion. And so we divide the entire national security structure into the two, two machines, the warning machine, the action machine. The warning machine, it's not just the intelligence community, it's everybody in government who sees things, thinks about them, assesses them, maybe worried about them, and then reports back to headquarters. Then the action machine is the side of the house that takes this in, in information and either acts on it or doesn't act on it. And the scenarios we can go through history, there's times when the warning has been very accurate and the action machine acted accordingly. There have been times when the warning machine was accurate and the action machine either didn't believe it or for political reasons didn't feel like acting. And there are times when the warning machine, like in, you know, played an uncertain trumpet, right? Maybe, maybe not. And there are times when the warning machine just misses it. Yeah, I'd love to go through some of those uh, you know, examples. I mean, obviously the uh, warning machine, the two contrasting examples over the past literal 20 years would be um, the warning machine and intelligence around Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. Um, and then obviously predicting uh, that Putin was going to invade um, Ukraine before February 2022, despite the skepticism from Ukrainian sources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think what's just interesting to me is that um, in both cases, 
you kind of have the same intelligence app. Oh, and then obviously you could add um, the bad intelligence around the bad analytical intelligence around how long Kabul and the Afghan government would hold out after the U.S. announcement of a withdrawal from the country in 2021. What's so interesting is you spend a lot of time describing like reforms to the warning system, the, those immediate post 9-11 reforms. Um, so on one level, so I guess you could add another success in that there hasn't been another uh, major domestic um, domestic attack. I didn't, I, I've spoken to a decent number of Bush administration officials and I did not understand until recently how deeply personally they were convinced there were going to be other 9-11 style events coming right down, um, right down the pipeline. I think it's important to note that that did not happen for good or for ill. Um, so I guess what I'm asking you is how can the same intelligence apparatus that post 9-11 one make those three different correct calls and errors. So um, I think good stewardship, stewardship of the homeland, horrible call, um, or not enough of a declarative call when it came to Iraq, horrible call in Kabul, but then a proper call with um, Ukraine. Exactly. Well, partly it's the personnel. I mean, think about the CIA director uh, ahead of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, Director Burns, who was an American ambassador to Moscow knows the country as well as anyone. So I think he has this fingertip sense of how to use intelligence. I think it's interesting. I think there's there's many arguments to be made that the CIA director should be a longtime analyst or operator. But there's another argument to make that the CIA director should be a career consumer of intelligence. And that's what Director Burns is, somebody who used intelligence through his long and distinguished State Department career. So he brought a different smart sense of what was important. Um, and I also think that Ukraine and the Russian invasion was a smaller target to keep an eye on than global terrorism. Um, and again, e even before 9-11, it was a surprise, absolutely. But there were lots of people who had been studying al-Qaeda and knew who bin Laden was. Maybe most Americans didn't, but there were people who knew something was coming. In fact, Steve Hadley, uh, the deputy national security advisor, we found the, the documents, he had ordered the Air Force to mount weapons on drones to hunt bin Laden in Afghanistan no later than September 1st, 2001. So there were people focusing on this, but just not focusing the right way or the entire system was not focusing on it. I guess the question for you would be, how would you assess then the status of the warning machine today, especially moving forward into the age of danger you're describing in the book? Right. So I think pieces of it work very, very well. You cited the example of you know, sharing intelligence on Putin's invasion of Ukraine, which no kidding was going to happen, even though even Ukrainians doubted it. Even on the collapse of, of Kabul and the the vanishing of the Afghan security forces that you mentioned. The only people who didn't know that was going to happen were people who had not been reading the quarterly reports from the Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction. Because for years, he'd been writing that billions of dollars spent to train the Afghan security forces was being wasted. He had argued again and again and again that trying to create an American-style military in Afghanistan requiring aircraft and lift and logistics that only U.S. troops and contractors could, could provide was not sustainable. So once first Trump and then Biden announced that we were leaving, the system just collapsed. That was entirely predictable, and somebody predicted it. His name is John Sopko. He's a modern Cassandra. He, he was cursed with the power of prophecy, but doubly cursed that nobody believed him. I guess the question would be, why? where was... Where's the break? So I want, I want this to be very um, lesson oriented, right? What is the lesson? Because it, it feels a little unsexy to have to, the lesson is read the read the inspector general's reports. Is 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 is, is the less expert? But sometimes that's the actual answer. Is is that the actual answer that you you need to have a process where the relevant information from the relevant actors gets to the relevant person? Um, so that's again a really smart question, and I, I don't want to. Um, have ad hominem attacks on individuals. So I will criticize in blanket form the people who didn't believe the cigar reports and thought the Afghan security forces would hold. They suffered from hubris and mendacity. They believed their view of what it should be like 
rather than what the facts were on the ground. And all throughout history, hubris and mendacity have led to strategic catastrophes like the collapse of of the uh, you know security forces in a matter of weeks when people thought they would hold on for at least some years. And of course, it didn't help when the leadership of Afghanistan fled, leaving the population behind. That's a kind of demoralizing thing. And I think as well, you know, the military, and again, I have great respect for people who serve and for the leadership. But if you go back and read speeches on Afghanistan, you know, we weren't there for 20 years. We were there 20 times, one year at a time. And so every new commander that came in relearned, you know, tried to reinvent the wheel. Every commander moved the goalposts, moved the metrics. If the metric was to have this many Afghan security forces trained by December 1st, they would say, well, we didn't we didn't reach that number. But, you know, that's not really the metric after all. And unless there is a civilian leadership enforcing quality control and military leadership willing to be honest about the limits of what it can do, we're going to have these catastrophes again because the military is a can-do organization. Any lawful order, order they will take and they will run twice as fast as you think they can. But what the military isn't trained to do is ask, huh, does this really make sense? Should we really be doing it? And I don't mean insubordination, but just going back to your civilian leaders and saying, why is this platoon of infantrymen building a school? Why is this, you know, airborne squad laying sewer? Shouldn't that be somebody else's job? We fight wars. We're not a force for democratization. Well, I mean, I used to be super into like coin and like counterinsurgency stuff. It seems like the the argument for um the, the military building schools is like, look, if you're in some corner of Helmand province and it's 2013 and troops are surging, uh, obviously the, the the force with the capacity and the need to integrate into the population is, for example, like the U.S. Marine Corps. So that's why they're building schools. Like, what would your response to that argument be? Like, there there, right. there, there wasn't a magical, like, hey, we, weren't, we obviously weren't going to send um, the Peace Corps into there. Um, USAID is like in of itself kind of a complicated agency. Um, I'm sure your argument isn't that. I, actually, I guess like, I'll, I'll take a step back. Maybe you're skeptical of like the coin centric arguments that that school ultimately mattered relative to the broader security picture. But what, what, what would your response to that be? Yeah. So I'm I'm not skeptical of coin. It's a very important um, strategy. But and I know you've heard this being a national security wonk like I am. If all you're using is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so the military became the hammer that pounded nails of killing bad guys. Um, tracking down bad guys and helping girls learn how, how to read. Now, all three of those are important. I just don't think the military should be in the lead for issue number three. And if it's not secure enough to bring in the Department of Education or USAID, then maybe we're doing something wrong because it's not the military job to, to do that. Again, we all support women's rights in Afghanistan. We all support um, poppy eradication, right? But is it the military's job? And when the military gives, gets all these other jobs, maybe it's not focusing on what it needs to be focused. And Marshall, it lets the rest of the government off the hook. I'm also realizing the very uh, clear, not even below the belt, uh, pushback to my point that thank you for not bringing up is just that, well, Marshall, we ran the experiment. We built schools for 20 years. Was the government more resilient to the return of the Taliban? The answer is um no. So we we actually, to a certain degree, we actually ran the experiment of like this broad conception. And then for a couple of different um, reasons, it didn't work. But if that does not work, that brought into mind bigger questions. Okay. So lots of good stuff on the warning machine. Let's get to the action machine. I think I, I'm really interested in, the, in this action uh, machine concept just because a, a frustration I take or a, a point of frustration when you read a lot of the popular works um, unpacking the war on terror um, period is just is is almost this, this assumption that the failures we had came down to the U.S. military, um, in the sense that you give these great examples in the book of the war, the Korean War starts, and our outdated World War II bazookas are literally like bouncing off of 
Soviet tanks that are given to the North Koreans. You could think of the example of Vietnam, where for a variety of like complicated reasons, like the, when the M16 first is put into the field, it's literally jamming. People are getting killed, but the Soviets have built a superior product with the AK-47. That's a literal example of like direct failure. I don't think there's an equivalent um, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, it, be, beyond just beyond just obviously needing to get MRAPs to the right people. Once we built the MRAPs, the MRAPs worked. The JDAMs that the CIA operators were using in conjunction with the Northern Alliance in 2001, they worked. So it wasn't a failure, quote unquote. So now that I've offered kind of like my defense of like the military's action-oriented status quo, like are there any holes in what I'm describing? Because a lot of my beef comes down to political and civilian leadership. I guess that's what I'm basically trying to say. Um, how would you think about this? Absolutely, you are correct. Because again, a blessing of our democracy is that the military answers to civilian leadership. We do not have a junta. We do not have a military dictatorship. And an example, I mean, two bookends, you know, that are very meaningful to me, because I covered both of them. Um, when the former Yugoslavia was breaking apart in the early 1990s, the national intelligence estimate prepared by the CIA predicting what would happen, and it's now declassified, so I'm not outing anything. You can read it online. Predicted with frightening accuracy that Serbia, which would inherit the majority of the Yugoslav National Army, would use any force necessary to protect Serb minorities in all the other republics as a cover for seizing those territories. That's exactly what happened. Every president, every defense secretary, every secretary of state had that NIE. But for five years, Bosnian Muslims and Croats were slaughtered by the Serbs until Srebrenica forced President Clinton's hand. And, you know, the war was over in a matter of months once the U.S. acted. So that was a classic case of clear warning, but a decision not to act. The other bookend of that is, is the rise of ISIS. You know, we all know that President Obama very famously dismissed ISIS as the junior varsity of, of terror. And the warning on that is a little trickier, to be sure. We talked to generals, we talked to other people involved in creating all of the intelligence assessments, and they all warned about a post-Saddam, post-Al-Qaeda terrorist group rising in Iraq and in Syria. But it was caveated because it wasn't quite as clear. And as we all know, President Obama, for very understandable and salutary reasons, campaigned on getting us out of Iraq. So because the warning was a little uncertain, and because Obama's very heartfelt political goal was to get us out of these forever wars, he decided not to act. And then ISIS took over a swath of the Middle East the size of Great Britain. I think so, another I think another thing to add to the story you're telling too is just that, and this is why so much of the the book and just the space comes down to personal leadership decisions. Um, aside from just the specific rise of ISIS, a huge part of that was um, decisions that Nouri al Maliki, like the Iraqi prime minister, was making towards um, basically wrecking all of the progress of uh, reconciling um, Sunnis back into um, Iraqi society. So you know. Uh, Plenty to criticize George W. Bush on, something not to criticize him on was that he formed like a very strong direct relationship with Al Maliki. And part of President Obama's uh, effective pull out of Iraq was, was, was in many ways like letting that um, leadership relationship um, wane. And maybe like there's very little Obama could have told um, Al Maliki in you know, 2012. But I think that there's just like a, this is just such a, um, I think that the, the quote, one of the quotes in the book is you said a lesson from this period is that the military doesn't win wars. It's a whole of government, whole of society aspect. I think that when we're involved or engaged in any relationship with a country, that leader to leader relationship is a huge part of that success story that needs to be factored in. That's completely true. Absolutely right. I think the um, question, a question I really want to ask is um, the, the way you really portray some of the 2000s period um, in terms of not being able to do two things at once is this focus on um, the present at a deeply important level over that future prospect of great power confidence. So a question that just comes to mind, all that said, we now have a then junior leadership class um, enlisted um, members of the armed forces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who have been put through 20 years of experience in these various degrees of conflict. Um, if we're thinking of 
uh, let's say the CCP and the Chinese specifically, um, they have not fought a conflict since their effective loss to Vietnam in 1979. I'm curious to what degree is it possible that the fact that we've just been battle tested um, in at a literal level, um, if that could make a difference um, when it comes down to a potential conflict, um, as in you could spend 50 years preparing your military, but there's a difference between that and actually experiencing conflict. How would you think about this? It's a, it's a great question. I think a couple of answers. One, um, any conflict over the Taiwan Straits, and I'm not being ironic here, will not involve ground forces. You know, it will involve, you know, air and naval forces. And China is rapidly producing very accurate long range missiles that could force the American Navy to stay outside the third island chain or could actually sink a carrier. Can you imagine, Marshall? What would happen in this country politically if we lost a capital ship with 3,000 sailors on board for the first time since you know World War II? And so I have no reason to doubt that Chinese technology is as good as we fear that it is. And as Stalin once said, sometimes mass has a mass all its own. I hate to quote Stalin, but it's a great line. And so the numbers of, of uh combat aircraft and missiles China is fielding is something to, to worry about. You talked about the officers who've come up the last 20 years. General McConville, the Army Chief of Staff, has a very interesting take on, on China. He has all of the combat ribbons from Iraq and Afghanistan, all the command service you would think. And he told me not long ago that the Army, as it prepares for a conflict with China, is going to be the support team service. In other words, it's there to support the Navy and the Air Force after 20 years of the Navy and the Air Force supporting the Army. So I think the last 20 years are being incorporated among the smartest of leaders to think in new ways. Because I guarantee there have been previous Army chiefs who had maps on their wall about what a land invasion of China would look like. I hope those maps are there only as a cautionary note right now, because as Secretary Gates said in his farewell speech, any defense secretary who again urges a land war in Asia ought to have his head examined. We haven't um, talked as much about um, nuclear conflict, but I guess something I found myself thinking, um, and you you hinted this with the with your point around like what would the American political reaction to the destruction of a capital ship be? Um, and the you know, and like three thousand people is literally a nine eleven um, level event. Um, I guess my thing is if I'm if I'm in the PLA or the Chinese political leadership, I am watching how effective uh, President Putin's saber rattling with the nuclear weapons was. Um, I entirely think it was it was saber rattling. He was not going to launch a nuke off of a initial counteroffensive, but at a strategic level, it just made sense. So I guess what I'm basically wondering is how do you think about just the the very just straight up possibility? I'm offering free advice to the PLA here as a person who studies American politics. The most important thing you could do before or as you launch your invasion of Taiwan is say this is an existential crisis for us. If any American or allied forces intervene, we will utilize tactical nuclear weapons, whether or not they're going to do it. If they just offered that warning, it seems to me that that, would, that, that in of itself could serve as just like an extreme deterrent um, in the American political system today. So I'm curious how you think about that underlying dynamic. We could talk about drones and you know DF-21s, anti-ship missiles versus just saying, we'll push the button. This is existential for us. It's not existential for you. One last thing I want to add on this, because you're kind of seeing from the more hawkish side of the debate, all of this focus on, well, Taiwan's a vital interest for us because of the semiconductors. You're very clearly going to see in that scenario, people say, it was a mistake to fight the Iraq war, blood for oil. And that wasn't what happened, but that's the rhetoric. They're going to say no blood for semiconductors, no blood, no nukes for semiconductors. I'll stick with my computer from five years ago. That's, that's just how I see that de debate. Dynamic. So I'm just curious what you think about this. Well, you're identifying some absolutely, I don't want to say hot button, that's some bad analogy, <laughs> but very, very important issues. You know, the United States is entering a period Unlike any in national security ever, we are soon going to be facing two completely realistic nuclear rivals. I mean, during the Cold War, China had minimal deterrence, as you know so well. We had to worry about it, but China by itself could not end life as we know it. But pretty soon, both Russia and China and how we manage that dynamic is a question that still has not been answered. 
And I think your your posing your free advice to the PLA uh, is very, very frightening because how would an American leader respond to that? I mean, there was always debate around NATO. Would we really trade Peoria for Paris? I mean, I don't think we're going to trade, you know, Tulsa for Taiwan. And so I think that that's a very, very challenging thing. And it goes back to, you know, with my age, I grew up in the era of deterrence. And I really do not think we have answered anew how we deter China in the Taiwan Straits. And I know some smart minds are thinking about that, Marshall, but there is not a clear answer. Yeah, and that's why I was very specific when I referenced like a tactical nuclear weapon in the Taiwan Strait. Um, just in the sense, obviously there would be, and this is where I'm extrapolating too far because like that could impact your invasion route like this, this or that. But just the very clear political case you can make from the Chinese side would be, we're not trying to nuke Peoria. We're just saying if an American carrier battle group tries to get within our sovereign territory, as would you, we will nuke that force. Um, that, 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 and that's what, and it's that kind of, it's kind of a, an example of how clownish the Russians were, um, Dmitry Medvedev specifically, which is that you didn't need to say, we'll rain nuclear hellfire upon London, this, this, or that. You just had to say, basically, tactical nuclear weapons are, are open game if this, this, or that happened. And that would genuinely cause people to pause. Um, okay. So I, I have one last, um, one last big question here. Um, so much to talk about, but, um, that's why folks should, uh, read the book. Um, there was a good quote from Robert Gates, um, um, that you cited where he, where he basically said he was concerned about all the futurism. Um, the, the, the word was a little different, but essentially just like futurism. He, he, he would, he would, he would, he has this great, his, his biography, his autobiography is so good. He had this great anecdote about how, you know, he comes in as defense secretary, secretary, it's 2007, the surge is starting and folks were working nine to five hours. People weren't there over the weekend, this, this, or that. So part of his reaction is like, I'm coming in, people aren't working as hard as they need to be. And when I'm asking, why don't we have MRAPs? People are talking about like foofy 2025 crises with like China. Um, that's his critique of futurism. Um, later on in the book, you cite um, Robert Wark, um, civilian Marine, Marine veteran, who um, is talking about um, something he calls um, the third offset, which is essentially um, how can we leverage like a strength of ours, our technological capabilities to like offset um, strengths that, let's say, in the case of China, that the Chinese have. I um, mean, he's talking about how, like, you know, in 10 years, if we don't have, you know, robots kicking down doors, we've really screwed up. And I guess it's so hard for me to look at the actual questions we're facing in Taiwan, uh, the domestic questions when it comes to supply chains, the questions of political leadership when it comes to tactical nukes. I'm just not convinced the futurism stuff is particularly important. So, like, what, what would what would you basically say to that? Um, sure. Because we we I don't know about you, but when I just read about how the defense industrial base has collapsed, it's just mind boggling to me. Um, so I'm curious what you think. Right. A couple of things. I, I would never pretend to speak for a defense secretary and Mr. Gates can answer himself, but his warnings about focus on futurism as opposed to the now war, he was brought on to save two wars. That's a real today. I mean, you know, the Associated Press has, has an old motto, there's a deadline every minute. Well, if you're SECDEF during two wars, there's a deadline every second. So he wanted people focusing on those two wars. Now that those two wars are behind us, I think the case can be made for expanding the aperture from today and preparing for future threats, known, anticipated, and unanticipated. And I think Mr. Work's third offset, it's funny, he gave that speech several years ago, and now all we're reading about in the paper is the danger of AI, the danger of chat GPT, and Work is, is right. Um, there is no human being who will be able to win a conflict against a, a effective machine learning AI, because the decision loop for a human is seconds or, or minutes. AI can make decisions in nanoseconds. Now, how you program them to follow the laws of war and all that hasn't been decided yet. But I think works futurism is much akin to that uh, fellow who quit Google in recent days because he was concerned about AI run amok. And so I think we do have to remember that we have to solve today's problems. We have to solve next week's, but the future deserves a seat at the table. I think that is a excellent place to leave it. Tom Shanker, this has been an amazing conversation. The book is Age of Danger, Keeping America Safe in an Era of New Superpowers, New Weapons, and New Threats. It is available now in bookstores.